Section 14 of Folklore and Legends Scandinavian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt Troutwine. Folklore and Legends Scandinavian by Charles John Tibbets. The Death of Balder. Balder the Good had dreams which forewarned him that his life was in danger and he told the gods of them. The gods took counsel together what should be done, and it was agreed that they should conjure away all danger that might threaten him. Frigga took an oath of fire, water, iron, and all other metals, stones, earth, trees, sicknesses, beasts, birds, poisons, and worms, that these would none of them hurt Balder. When this had been done, the gods used to divert themselves. Balder, standing up in the assembly, and all the others throwing at him, hewing at him, and smiting him with stones, for, do all they would, he received no hurt. And in this sport all enjoyed themselves. Loki, however, looked on with envy when he saw that Balder was not hurt. So he assumed the form of a woman, and set out to Fenseler, to Frigga. Frigga asked if the stranger knew what the gods did when they met. He answered that they all shot at Balder, and he was not hurt. No weapon nor tree may hurt Balder, answers Frigga. I have taken an oath of them all not to do so. What, said the pretended woman, have all these things sworn to spare Balder? There is only one little twig which grows to the east of Valhalla, which is called mistletoe. Of that I took no oath, for it seemed to me too young and feeble to do any hurt. Then the strange woman departed, and Loki, having found the mistletoe, cut it off and went to the assembly. There he found Hador standing apart by himself, for he was blind. Then said Loki to him, Why do you not throw at Balder? Because, said he, I am blind and I cannot see, and besides, I have nothing to throw. Do as the others, said Loki, and honor Balder as the rest do. I will direct your aim. Throw the shaft at him. Hodor took the mistletoe, and, Loki directing him, aimed at Balder. The aim was good. The shaft pierced him through, and Balder fell dead upon the earth. Surely never was there a greater misfortune either among gods or men. When the gods saw that Balder was dead, then they were silent, aghast, and stood motionless. They looked on one another, and were all agreed as to what he deserved who had done the deed. But out of respect to the place, none dared to avenge Balder's death. They broke the silence at length with wailing words failing them with which to express their sorrow. Odin, as was right, was more sorrowful than any of the others, for he best knew what a loss the gods had sustained. At last, when the gods had recovered themselves, Frigga asked, Who is there among the gods who will win my love and goodwill? That shall he have if he will ride to Hel and seek Balder, and offer Hela a reward if she will let Balder come home to Asgard. Hermod the nimble, Odin's lad, said he would make the journey. So he mounted Odin's horse, Sleipnir, and went his way. The gods took Baldur's body down to the seashore, where stood Ringhorn, Baldur's vessel, the biggest in the world. When the gods tried to launch it into the water, in order to make on it a funeral fire for Baldur, the ship would not stir. Then they dispatched one to Jotunheim, for the sorceress called Hiroken, who came riding on a wolf with twisted serpents by way of reins. Odin called for four berserker to hold the horse, but they could not secure it till they had thrown it to the ground. Then Hiroken went to the stem of the ship and set it afloat with a single touch, the vessel going so fast that fire sprang from the rollers and the earth trembled. Then Thor was so angry that he took his hammer and wanted to cast it at the woman's head. But the gods pleaded for her and appeased him. The body of Balder being placed on the ship, Nana, the daughter of Nep, Balder's wife, seeing it, died of a broken heart. So she was borne to the pile and thrown into the fire. Thor stood up and consecrated the pile with Mjolnir. A little dwarf called Litur ran before his feet, and Thor gave him a push and threw him into the fire, and he was burnt. Many kinds of people came to this ceremony. With Odin came Frigga, and the Valkyr with his ravens. 
Frey drove in a car drawn by the boar. Gulenbursti or Slegoratoni. Heimdall rode his horse Gultop, and Freya drove her cats. There were also many of the forest giants and mountain giants there. On the pile, Odin laid the gold ring called Dropnir, giving it the property that every ninth night it produces eight rings of equal weight. In the same pile was also consumed Baldur's horse. For nine nights and days, Hermod rode through the deep valleys, so dark that he could see nothing. Then he came to the river Gyll, which he crossed by the bridge, which was covered with shining gold. The maid who keeps the bridge is called Mudgudur. She asked Hamad his name and family, and told him that on the former day there had ridden over the bridge five bands of dead men. They did not make my bridge ring as you do, and you do not have the hue of the dead. Why ride you thus on the way to hell? I ride to hell to find Baldur. Have you seen him on his way to this place? Baldur, answered she, has passed over the bridge, but the way to hell is below to the north. Hermod rode till he came to the entrance of hell which was guarded by a grate. He dismounted, looked at the girths of his saddle, mounted, and clapping his spurs into the horse, cleared the grate easily. Then he rode on to the hall and, dismounting, entered it. There he saw his brother, Balder, seated in the first place, and there Hermod stopped for the night. In the morning he saw Hela and begged her to let Balder ride home with him, telling her how much the gods had sorrowed over his death. Ella told him she would test whether it were true that Baldur was so much loved. If, said she, all things weep for him, then he shall return to the gods. But if any speak against him or refuse to weep, then he shall remain in hell. Then Hermod rose to go, and Baldur, leading him out of the hall, gave him the ring at Dropner, which he wished Odin to have as a keepsake. Nana also sent Frigga a present, and a ring to Fulla. Hermod rode back, and coming to Asgard, related all he had seen and heard. Then the gods sent messengers all over the world seeking to get Baldur brought back again by weeping. All wept, men and living things, earth, stones, trees, and metals, all weeping as they do when they are subjected to heat after frost. Then the messengers came back again, thinking they had done their errand well. On their way, they had came to a cave wherein sat a hag named Thought. The messengers prayed her to assist in weeping Baldur out of hell. I will weep dry tears, answered she, over Baldur's pyre. What gain I by son of man, be he live or dead? Let Hela hold what she has. It was thought that this must have been Loki, Lofi's son, he who has ever wrought such harm to the gods. End of The Death of Baldur Recording by Kurt Troutwine Section 15 of Folklore and Legend Scandinavian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt Troutwine. Folklore and Legends Scandinavian by Charles John Tibbets. The Punishment of Loki. The gods were so angry with Loki that he had to run away and hide himself in the mountains, and there he built a house which had four doors, so that he could see around him on every side. He would often in the daytime change himself into a salmon and hide himself in the water called Franan Gersfors, and he thought over what trick the gods might devise to capture him there. One day, while he sat in his house, he took flax and yarn, and with it made meshes like those of a net a fire burning in front of him. Then he became aware that the gods were near at hand, for Odin had seen out of Lidskulf where he was. Loki sprang up, threw his work into the fire, and went to the river. When the gods came to the house, the first entered was Vasir, who was the most cute of them all. In the hot embers he saw the ashes of a net, such as is used in fishing, and he told the gods of it, and they made a net like that which they saw in the ashes. When it was ready, they went to the river and cast the net in, Thor holding one end, and the rest of the gods the other, and so they drew it. 
loki travelled in front of it and lay down between the two stones so that the net went over him but the gods felt that something living had been against the net then they cast the net a second time binding up in it a weight so that nothing could pass under it loki travelled before it till he saw the sea in front of him then he leapt over the top of the net and again made his way upstream the gods saw this so they once more dragged the stream while thor waited in the middle of it so they went to the sea then loki saw in what a dangerous situation he was he must risk his life if he swam out to sea the only other alternative was to leap over the net that he did jumping as quickly as he could over the top cord thor snatched at him and tried to hold him but he slipped through his hand and would have escaped but for his tail and this is the reason why salmon have their tails so thin loki being captured they took him to a certain cavern and they took three rocks through each of which they bored a hole then they took loki's sons vali and nari and having changed vali into a wolf he tore his brother nari into pieces then the gods took his intestines and bound loki with them to the three stones and they changed the cord into bands of iron Scotty then took a serpent and suspended over loki's head so that the venom drops from it onto his face saguna loki's wife stands near him and holds a dish receiving the venom as it falls and when the dish is full she goes out and pours its contents away while she is doing this however the venom falls on loki and causes him such intense pain that he writhes so that the earth is shaken as if by an earthquake there he lies in ragnarok the twilight of the gods end of the punishment of loki recording by kurt troutwine section sixteen of folklore and legends scandinavian this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt Troutwine. Folklore and Legends Scandinavian by Charles John Tibbets. Origin of Teese Lake. A troll had once taken up his abode near the village of Kund, in the high bank on which the church now stands. But when the people about there had become pious and went constantly to the church, the troll was dreadfully annoyed by their almost incessant ringing of the bells in the steeple of the church he was at last obliged in consequence of it to take his departure for nothing has more contributed to the immigration of the troll folk out of the country than the increasing piety of the people and their taking to bell ringing the troll of kund accordingly quitted the country and went over to funen where he lived for some time in peace and quiet now it chanced that a man who had lately settled in the town of kund coming to funen on business met this same troll on the road where do you live asked the troll now there was nothing whatever about the troll unlike a man so he answered him as was the truth i am from the town of kund so said the troll i don't know you then and yet i think i know every man in kund will you however said he be so kind as to take a letter for me back with you to kund the man of course said he had no objection the troll then went away in great haste and with him the letter went entirely out of the man's mind but when he came back to zealand he sat down by a meadow where tis lake now is and suddenly recollected the troll's letter he felt a great desire to look at it at least so he took it out of his pocket and sat a while with it in his hands when suddenly there began to dribble a little water out of the seal the letter now unfolded itself and the water came out faster and faster and it was with the utmost difficulty that the poor man was able to save his life for the malicious troll had enclosed a whole lake in the letter the troll it is plain had thought to avenge himself of coon church by destroying it in this manner but god ordered it so that the lake chanced to run out in the great meadow where it now stands End of Origin of Tees Lake Recording by Kurt Troutwine Section number 17 
of Folklore and Legend Scandinavian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Folklore and Legend Scandinavian by Charles John Tibbets There are such women. There was, once upon a time, a man and his wife, and they wanted to sow their fields, but they had neither seed nor money to buy it with. However, they had one cow, and so they decided that the man should drive it to the town and sell it, so that they might buy seed with the money. When the time came, however, the woman was afraid to let her husband take the cow, fearing he would spend the money in drink. So she set off herself with the cow, and took a hen with her also. When she was near the town she met a butcher, who said, do you want to sell the cow mother yes answered she i do how much do you want for it i want a mark for the cow and you shall have the hen for sixty marks well said he i have no need of the hen you can get rid of that when you come to the town but i will give you a mark for the cow she sold him the cow and got the mark for it but when she came to the town she could find no one who would give her sixty marks for a tough lean hen so she went back to the butcher and said, "'I cannot get this hen off, master, so you had better take it also with the cow.' "'We will see about it,' said the butcher. So he gave her something to eat, and gave her so much brandy that she became tipsy and lost her senses and fell asleep. When he saw that, the butcher dipped her in a barrel of tar, and then laid her on a heap of feathers. When she awoke, she found herself feathered all over and wondered at herself, "'Is it me, or someone else?' said she. No, it cannot be me. It must be a strange bird. How shall I find out whether it is me or not? Oh, I know. When I get home, if the calves lick me, and the dog does not bark at me, then it is me myself. The dog had no sooner seen her than he began to bark, as if there were thieves and robbers in the yard. Now, said she, I see it is not me. She went to the cow-house, but the calves would not lick her, for they smelt the strong tar. No, said she, I see it cannot be me, it must be some strange bird. So she crept up to the top of the barn and began to flap her arms, as if they had been wings, and tried to fly. Her husband saw her, so he came out with his gun and took aim. Don't shoot, don't shoot, called his wife, it is me. Is it you? said the man. Then don't stand there like a goat, come down and tell me what account you can give of yourself. She crept down again, but she had not a shilling, for she had lost the mark the butcher had given her while she was drunk. When the man heard that, he was very angry, and declared he would leave her, and never come back again until he had found three women as big fools as his wife. So he set off, and when he had gone a little way he saw a woman who ran in and out of a newly built wood hut with an empty sieve. Every time she ran in, she threw her apron over the sieve as if she had something in it. "'Why do you do that, mother?' asked he. "'Why, I am only carrying in a little sun,' said she. "'But I don't understand how it is. When I am outside, I get the sunshine in the sieve, but when I get in, I have somehow lost it. When I was in my old hut, I had plenty of sunshine, though I never carried it in. I wish I knew someone who could give me sunshine. I would give him three hundred dollars.' "'Have you an axe?' asked the man. "'If so, I will get you sunshine.' She gave him an axe, and he cut some windows in the hut, for the carpenter had forgotten them. Then the sun shone in, and the woman gave him three hundred dollars. "'That's one,' said the man, and he set out once more. Sometime after, he came to a house in which he heard a terrible noise and bellowing. He went in and saw a woman who was beating her husband across the head with a stick with all her might. Over the man's head there was a shirt, in which there was no hole for his head to go through. "'Mother!' said he, will you kill your husband? No, said she, I only want a hole for his head in the shirt. The man called out and, struggling, cried, Heaven preserve and comfort all such as have new shirts. If any one would only teach my wife some new way to make a head hole in them, I would gladly give him three hundred dollars. That shall soon be done. Give me a pair of scissors, said the other. The woman gave him the scissors, and he cut a hole in the shirt for the man's head to go through and took the three hundred dollars. That's number two, he said to himself. 
After some time he came to a farmhouse where he thought he would rest a while. When he went in, the woman said, "'Where do you come from, father?' "'I am from Ringeridge, Paradise,' said he. "'Ah, dear, dear, are you from Hemorridge, Heaven?' said she. "'Then you will know my second husband, Peter. Happy may he be.' The woman had had three husbands. The first and third had been bad and had used her ill, but the second had used her well, so she counted him as safe. "'Yes,' said the man, "'I know him well.' "'How does he get on there?' asked the woman. "'Only pretty well,' said the man. "'He goes about begging from one house to another, and has but little food or clothes on his back. As to money, he has nothing.' "'Heaven have mercy on him!' cried the woman. "'He ought not to go about in such a miserable state when he left so much behind. "'There's a cupboard full of clothes which belong to him, and there's a big box full of money, too. "'If you will take the things with you, you can have a horse and cart to carry them. "'He can keep the horse, and he can sit in the cart as he goes from house to house, for so he ought to go. "'The man from Ringeridge got a whole cartload of clothes and a box full of bright silver money with the meat and drink, as much as he wanted.' When he had got all he wished, he got into the cart and once more set out. "'That is the third, he said to himself. Now the woman's third husband was ploughing in a field, and when he saw a man he did not know come out of his yard with his horse and cart, he went home and asked his wife who it was that was going off with the black horse. "'Oh,' said the woman, "'that is a man from Hemorrhage, heaven. He told me that things went so miserably with my second Peter, my poor husband, that he had to go begging from house to house and had no money or clothes. I have therefore sent him the old clothes he left behind, and the old money-box with the money in it. The man saw how matters were, so he saddled a horse and went out of the yard at full speed. It was not long before he came up to the man who sat and drove the cart. When the other saw him, he drove the horse and cart into a wood pulled a handful of hair out of the horse's tail, and ran up a little hill, where he tied the hair fast to a birch tree. Then he lay down under the tree, and began to look and stare at the sky. "'Well, well,' said he, as if talking to himself, when Peter the Third came near. "'Well, never have I seen anything to match it.' Peter stood still for a time and looked at him, and wondered what was come to him. At last he said, "'Why do you lie there and stare so?' "'I never saw anything like it,' said the other. "'A man has gone up to heaven on a black horse. "'Here in the birch tree is some of the horse's tail hanging, "'and there in the sky you may see the black horse.' "'Peter stared first at the man and then at the sky, and said, "'For my part I see nothing but some hair out of a horse's tail in the birch tree.' "'Yes,' said the other. "'You cannot see it where you stand, but come here and lie down, and look up and take care not to take your eyes off the sky. Peter the Third lay down and stared up at the sky, till the tears ran from his eyes. The man from Ringeridge took his horse, mounted it, and galloped away with it, and the horse, and cart. When he heard the noise on the road, Peter the Third sprang up, but when he found the man had gone off with his horse, he was so astonished that he did not think of going after him till it was too late. He was very down-faced when he went home to his wife, and when she asked him what he had done with the horse, he said— I gave it to Peter the Second, for I didn't think it was right he should sit in a cart and jolt about from house to house in hemorrhage. Now, then, he can sell the cart and buy himself a coach, and drive about. Heaven bless you for that, said the woman. I never thought you were so kind-hearted a man. When the Ringeridge man reached home with his six hundred dollars, his cartload of clothes, and the money, he saw that all his fields were ploughed and sown. The first question he put to his wife was how she had got the seed. "'Well,' said she, "'I always heard that what a man sowed he reaped, so I sowed the salt the North people left here, and if we only have rain I don't doubt but that it will come up nicely.' "'You are silly,' said the man, "'and silly you must remain, but that does not much matter, for the others are as silly as yourself.' End of section 17. Recording by Sarah Jump. Section 18 of Folklore and Legends, Scandinavian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah.
folklore and legends scandinavian by charles john tibbets section eighteen tales of the nisses the niss is the same being that is called kobold in germany and brownie in scotland he is in denmark and norway also called nissa god drang nissa good lad and in sweden tomt guba the old man of the house he is of the dwarf family and resembles them in appearance and like them has the command of money and the same dislike to noise and tumult his usual dress is grey with a pointed red cap but on michaelmas day he wears a round hat like those of the peasants no farmhouse goes on well without there is a niss in it and well is it for the maids and the men when they are in favour with him they may go to their beds and give themselves no trouble about their work and yet in the morning the maids will find the kitchen swept up and water brought in and the men will find the horses in the stable well cleaned and curried and perhaps a supply of corn cribbed for them from the neighbor's barns there was a niss in a house in jutland he every evening got his grout at the regular time and he in return used to help both the men and the maids and look to the interest of the master of the house in every respect there came one time a mischievous boy to live at service in this house and his great delight was whenever he got an opportunity to give the niss all the annoyance in his power late one evening when everything was quiet in the house the niss took his little wooden dish and was just going to eat his supper when he perceived that the boy had put the butter at the bottom and had concealed it in hopes that he might eat the grout first and then find the butter when all the grout was gone he accordingly set about thinking how he might repay the boy in kind after pondering a little he went up into the loft where a man and the boy were lying asleep in the same bed the niss whisked off the bedclothes and when he saw the little boy by the tall man he said short and long don't match and with this word he took the boy by the legs and dragged him down to the man's feet he then went up to the head of the bed and short and long don't match said he again and then he dragged the boy up to the man's head do what he would he could not succeed in making the boy as long as the man but persisted in dragging him up and down in the bed and continued at this work the whole night long till it was broad daylight by this time he was well tired so he crept up on the window-stool and sat with his legs dangling down into the yard the house-dog for all dogs have a great enmity to the niss as soon as he saw him began to bark at him which afforded him much amusement as the dog could not get up to him so he put down first one leg and then the other and teased the dog saying look at my little leg look at my little leg in the meantime the boy had awoke and had stolen up behind him and while the niss was least thinking of it and was going on with his look at my little leg the boy tumbled him down into the yard to the dog crying out at the same time look at the whole of him now there lived a man in thirsting in jutland who had a niss in his barn this niss used to attend to his cattle and at night he would steal fodder for them from the neighbors so that this farmer had the best fed and most thriving cattle in the country one time the boy went along with the niss to fugerlis to steal corn the niss took as much as he thought he could well carry but the boy was more covetous and said oh take more sure we can rest now and then rest said the niss rest and what is rest do what i tell you replied the boy take more and we shall find rest when we get out of this the niss took more and they went away with it but when they came to the lands of thirsting the niss grew tired and then the boy said to him 
here now is rest and they both sat down on the side of a little hill if i had known said the nis as they sat if i had known that rest was so good i'd have carried off all that was in the barn it happened some time after that the boy and the nis were no longer friends and as the nis was sitting one day in the granary window with his legs hanging out into the yard the boy ran at him and tumbled him back into the granary the nis was revenged on him that very night for when the boy was gone to bed he stole down to where he was lying and carried him as he was into the yard then he laid two pieces of wood across the well and put him lying on them expecting that when he awoke he would fall from the fright into the well and be drowned he was however disappointed for the boy came off without injury there was a man who lived in the town of turrup who had a very handsome white mare this mare had for many years belonged to the same family and there was a nis attached to her who brought luck to the place this nis was so fond of the mare that he could hardly endure to let them put her to any kind of work and he used to come himself every night and feed her of the best and as for this purpose he usually brought a superfluity of corn both thrashed and in the straw from the neighbors barns all the rest of the cattle enjoyed the advantage and they were all kept in exceedingly good condition it happened at last that the farmhouse passed into the hands of a new owner who refused to put any faith in what they had told him about the mare so the luck speedily left the place and went after the mare to a poor neighbor who had bought her within five days after his purchase the poor farmer began to find his circumstances gradually improving while the income of the other day after day fell away and diminished at such a rate that he was hard set to make both ends meet if now the man who had got the mare had only known how to be quiet and enjoy the good times that were come upon him he and his children and his children's children after him would have been in flourishing circumstances till this very day but when he saw the quantity of corn that came every night to his barn he could not resist his desire to get a sight of the nis so he concealed himself one evening at nightfall in the stable and as soon as it was midnight he saw how the nis came from his neighbor's barn and brought a sack full of corn with him it was now unavoidable that the nis should get a sight of the man who was watching so he with evident marks of grief gave the mare her food for the last time cleaned and dressed her to the best of his ability and when he had done turned round to where the man was lying and bid him farewell from that day forward the circumstances of both the neighbors were on an equality for each now kept his own End of section 18. Section 19 of Folklore and Legends Scandinavian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carolyn Lilliard. Folklore and Legends Scandinavian by Charles John Tibbet. The Dwarf's Banquet. There lived in Norway, not far from the city of Drontheim, a powerful man who was blessed with all the goods of fortune. A part of the surrounding country was his property, numerous herds fed on his pastures, and a great retinue and a crowd of servants adorned his mansion. He had an only daughter called Aslog the fame of whose beauty spread far and wide. The greatest men of the country sought her, but all were alike unsuccessful in their suit, and he who had come full of confidence and joy rode away home, silent and melancholy. Her father, who thought his daughter delayed her choice only to select, forbore to interfere, and exulted in her prudence, 
but when at length the richest and noblest tried their fortune with as little success as the rest he grew angry and called his daughter and said to her hitherto i have left you to your free choice but since i see that you reject all without any distinction and the very best of your suitors seem not good enough for you i will keep measures no longer with you what shall my family become extinct and my inheritance pass away into the hands of strangers i will break your stubborn spirit i give you now till the festival of the great winter night make your choice by that time or prepare to accept him whom i shall fix on aslog loved a youth named orm handsome as he was brave and noble she loved him with her whole soul and she would sooner die than bestow her hand on another but orm was poor and poverty compelled him to serve in the mansion of her father aslog's partiality for him was kept a secret for her father's pride of power and wealth was such that he would never have given his consent to a union with so humble a man when aslog saw the darkness of his countenance and heard his angry words she turned pale as death for she knew his temper and doubted not that he would put his threats into execution without uttering a word in reply she retired to her chamber and thought deeply but in vain how to avert the dark storm that hung over her the great festival approached nearer and nearer and her anguish increased every day at last the lovers resolved on flight i know said orm a secure place where we may remain undiscovered until we find an opportunity of quitting the country at night when all were asleep orm led the trembling aslog over the snow and ice fields away to the mountains the moon and the stars sparkling still brighter in the cold winter's night lighted them on their way they had under their arms a few articles of dress and some skins of animals which were all they could carry they ascended the mountains the whole night long till they reached a lonely spot enclosed with lofty rocks here orm conducted the weary aslog into a cave the low and narrow entrance to which was hardly perceptible but it soon enlarged to a great hall reaching deep into the mountain he kindled a fire and they now reposing on their skins sat in the deepest solitude far away from all the world orm was the first who had discovered this cave which is shown to this very day and no one knew anything of it they were safe from the pursuit of aslog's father they passed the whole winter in this retirement orm used to go a-hunting and aslog stayed at home in the cave minded the fire and prepared the necessary food frequently did she mount the points of the rocks but her eyes wandered as far as they could reach only over glittering snow-fields the spring now came on the woods were green the meadows pat on their various colors and aslog could but rarely and with circumspection venture to leave the cave one evening orm came in with the intelligence that he had recognized her father's servants in the distance and that he could hardly have been unobserved by them whose eyes were as good as his own they will surround this place continued he and never rest till they have found us we must quit our retreat then without a minute's delay they accordingly descended on the other side of the mountain and reached the strand where they fortunately found a boat orm shoved off and the boat drove into the open sea they had escaped their pursuers but they were now exposed to dangers of another kind whither should they turn themselves they could not venture to land for aslog's father was lord of the whole coast and they would infallibly fall into his hands nothing then remained for them but to commit their bark to the winds and waves they drove along the entire night at break of day the coast had disappeared and they saw nothing but the sky above the sea beneath and the waves that rose and fell 
they had not brought one morsel of food with them and thirst and hunger now began to torment them three days did they toss about in this state of misery and aslog faint and exhausted saw nothing but certain death before her at length on the evening of the third day they discovered an island of tolerable magnitude and surrounded by a number of smaller ones orm immediately steered for it but just as he came near to it there suddenly arose a violent wind and the sea rolled higher and higher against him he turned about with a view of approaching it on another side but with no better success his vessel as often as he approached the island was driven back as if by an invisible power lord god cried he and blessed himself and looked on poor oslog who seemed to be dying of weakness before his eyes scarcely had the exclamation passed his lips when the storm ceased the waves subsided and the vessel came to the shore without encountering any hindrance orm jumped out on the beach some muscles that he found upon the strand strengthened and revived the exhausted aslog so that she was soon able to leave the boat the island was overgrown with low dwarf shrubs and seemed to be uninhabited but when they had got about the middle of it they discovered a house reaching but a little above the ground and appearing to be half under the surface of the earth in the hope of meeting human beings and assistance the wanderers approached it they listened if they could hear any noise but the most perfect silence reigned there orm at length opened the door and with his companion walked in but what was their surprise to find everything regulated and arranged as if for inhabitants yet not a single living creature visible the fire was burning on the hearth in the middle of the room and a kettle with fish hung on it apparently only waiting for someone to take it off and eat the beds were made and ready to receive their weary tenants orm and aslog stood for some time dubious and looked on with a certain degree of awe but at last overcome with hunger they took up the food and ate when they had satisfied their appetites and still in the last beams of the setting sun which now streamed over the island far and wide discovered no human being they gave way to weariness and laid themselves in the beds to which they had been so long strangers they had expected to be awakened in the night by the owners of the house on their return home but their expectation was not fulfilled they slept undisturbed till the morning sun shone in upon them no one appeared on any of the following days and it seemed as if some invisible power had made ready the house for their reception they spent the whole summer in perfect happiness they were to be sure solitary yet they did not miss mankind the wild birds eggs and the fish they caught yielded them provisions in abundance when autumn came aslog presented orm with a son in the midst of their joy at his appearance they were surprised by a wonderful apparition the door opened on a sudden and an old woman stepped in she had on her a handsome blue dress there was something proud but at the same time strange and surprising in her appearance do not be afraid said she at my unexpected appearance i am the owner of this house and i thank you for the clean and neat state in which you have kept it and for the good order in which i find everything with you i would willingly have come sooner but i had no power to do so till this little heathen pointing to the newborn babe was come to the light now i have free access only fetch no priest from the mainland to christen it or i must depart again if you will in this matter comply with my wishes you may not only continue to live here but all the good that ever you can wish for i will cause you whatever you take in hand shall prosper good luck shall follow you wherever you go but break this condition and depend upon it that misfortune after misfortune will come on you 
and even on this child will I avenge myself. If you want anything, or are in danger, you have only to pronounce my name three times, and I will appear and lend you assistance. I am of the race of the old giants, and my name is Guru. But beware of uttering in my presence the name of him whom no giant may hear of, and never venture to make the sign of the cross, or to cut it on beam or on board of the house. You may dwell in this house the whole year long. Only be so good as to give it up to me on Yule evening, when the sun is at the lowest, as then we celebrate our great festival, and then only are we permitted to be merry. At least, if you should not be willing to go out of the house, keep yourselves up in the loft as quiet as possible the whole day long, and as you value your lives, do not look down into the room until midnight is past. After that, you may take possession of everything again. When the old woman had thus spoken, she vanished, and Aslog and Orm, now at ease respecting their situation, lived without any disturbance, content and happy. Orm never made a cast of his net without getting a plentiful draught. He never shot an arrow from his bow that missed its aim. In short, whatever they took in hand, were it ever so trifling, evidently prospered. When Christmas came, they cleaned up the house in the best manner, set everything in order, kindled a fire on the hearth, and, as the twilight approached, they went up to the loft, where they remained quiet and still. At length it grew dark. There was a hole in the roof over the fireplace, which might be opened or shut, either to let in the light from above or to afford a free passage for the smoke. Orm lifted up the lid, which was covered with a skin, and put out his head. But what a wonderful sight then presented itself to his eyes! The little islands around were all lit up with countless blue lights, which moved about without ceasing, jumping up and down, then skipped down to the shore, assembled together, and now came nearer and nearer to the large island where Orm and Aslog lived. At last they reached it and arranged themselves in a circle around a large stone not far from the shore and which Orm knew well. What was his surprise when he saw that the stone had now completely assumed the form of a man, though of a monstrous and gigantic one? He could clearly perceive that the little blue lights were borne by dwarfs, whose pale clay-colored faces with their huge noses and red eyes, disfigured too by bird's bills and owl's eyes, were supported by misshapen bodies. They tottered and wobbled about here and there, so that they seemed to be, at the same time, merry and in pain. Suddenly the circle opened, the little ones retired on each side, and Guru, who was now much enlarged, and of as immense a size as the stone, advanced with gigantic steps. She threw both her arms around the stone image, which immediately began to receive life and motion. As soon as the first sign of motion showed itself, the little ones began, with wonderful capers and grimaces, a song, or, to speak more properly, a howl with which the whole island resounded and seemed to tremble. Orm, quite terrified, drew in his head, and he and Aslog remained in the dark, so still that they hardly ventured to draw their breath. The procession moved on towards the house, as might be clearly perceived by the nearer approach of the shouting and crying. They were now all come in, and light and active, the dwarves jumped about on the benches, and heavy and loud sounded, at intervals, the steps of the giants. Orm and his wife heard them covering the table, and the clattering of the plates, and the shouts of joy with which they celebrated their banquet. When it was over, and it drew near to midnight, 
they begin to dance to that ravishing fairy air which charms the mind into such sweet confusion and which some have heard in the rocky glens and learned by listening to the underground musicians as soon as asla caught the sound of the air she felt an irresistible longing to see the dance nor was orm able to keep her back let me look said she or my heart will burst she took her child and placed herself at the extreme end of the loft whence without being observed she could see all that passed long did she gaze without taking off her eyes for an instant on the dance on the bold and wonderful springs of the little creatures who seemed to float in the air and not so much as touch the ground while the ravishing melody of the elves filled her whole soul the child meanwhile which lay in her arms grew sleepy and drew its breath heavily and without ever thinking of the promise she had given to the old woman she made as is usual the sign of the cross over the mouth of the child and said christ bless you my babe the instant she had spoken the word there was raised a horrible piercing cry the spirits tumbled head over heels out at the door with terrible crushing and crowding their lights went out and in a few minutes the whole house was clear of them and left desolate orm and aslog frightened to death hid themselves in the most retired nook in the house they did not venture to stir till daybreak and not till the sun shone through the hole in the roof down on the fireplace did they feel courage enough to descend from the loft the table remained still covered as the underground people had left it all their vessels which were of silver and manufactured in the most beautiful manner were upon it in the middle of the room there stood upon the ground a huge copper kettle half full of sweet mead and by the side of it a drinking horn of pure gold in the corner lay against the wall a stringed instrument not unlike a dulcimer which as people believe the giantesses used to play on they gazed on what was before them full of admiration but without venturing to lay their hands on anything but great and fearful was their amazement when on turning about they saw sitting at the table an immense figure which orm instantly recognized as the giant whom guru had animated by her embrace he was now a cold and hard stone while they were standing gazing on it guru herself entered the room in her giant form she wept so bitterly that the tears trickled down on the ground it was long ere her sobbing permitted her to utter a single word at length she spoke great affliction have you brought on me and henceforth must i weep while i live i know you have not done this with evil intentions and therefore i forgive you though it were a trifle for me to crush the whole house like an eggshell over your heads alas cried she my husband whom i love more than myself there he sits petrified for ever never again will he open his eyes three hundred years lived i with my father on the island of kunen happy in the innocence of youth as the fairest among the giant maidens mighty heroes sued for my hand the sea around that island is still filled with the rocky fragments which they hurled against each other in their combats andvin won the victory and i plighted myself to him but ere i was married came the detestable odin into the country who overcame my father and drove us all from the island my father and sisters fled to the mountains and since that time my eyes have beheld them no more aunt Find and i saved ourselves on this island where we for a long time lived in peace and quiet and thought it would never be interrupted destiny which no one escapes had determined it otherwise Olaf came from Britain. They called him the Holy, 
and Anfin instantly found that his voyage would be inauspicious to the giants. When he heard how Olaf's ship rushed through the waves, he went down to the strand and blew the sea against him with all his strength. The waves swelled up like mountains, but Olaf was still more mighty than he. His ship flew unchecked through the billows like an arrow from a bow. He steered direct for our island. When the ship was so near that Anfin thought he could reach it with his hands, he grasped at the forepart with his right hand and was about to drag it down to the bottom as he had often done with other ships. Then Olaf, the terrible Olaf, stepped forward and crossing his hands over each other, he cried with a loud voice, Stand there as a stone till the last day. And in the same instant my unhappy husband became a mass of rock. The ship went on unimpeded, and ran direct against the mountain, which it cut through, separating from it the little island which lies yonder. Ever since my happiness has been annihilated, and lonely and melancholy have I passed my life. On Yule Eve alone can petrified giants receive back their life for the space of seven hours, if one of their race embraces them, and is, at the same time, willing to sacrifice a hundred years of his own life. Seldom does a giant do that. I loved my husband too well not to bring him back cheerfully to life every time that I could do it, even at the highest price, and never would I reckon how often I had done it, that I might not know when the time came when I myself should share his fate. And at the moment I threw my arms around him, became, become the same as he. Alas, now even this comfort is taken from me. I can never more by any embrace awake him since he has heard the name which I dare not utter, and never again will he see the light till the dawn of the last day shall bring it. Now I go hence. You will never again behold me. All that is here in the house I give you. My dulcimer alone will I keep. Let no one venture to fix his habitation on the little islands which lie around here. There dwell the little underground ones whom you saw at the festival, and I will protect them as long as I live. With these words, Guru vanished. The next spring, Orm took the golden horn and the silver ware to Drondheim, where no one knew him. The value of these things was so great that he was able to purchase everything a wealthy man desires. He loaded his ship with the purchases and returned to the island where he spent many years in unalloyed happiness, and Aslog's father was soon reconciled to his wealthy son-in-law. The stone image remained sitting in the house. No human power was able to move it. So hard was the stone that hammer and axe flew in pieces without making the slightest impression upon it. The giant sat there till a holy man came to the island, who, with one single word, removed him back to his former station, where he stands to this hour. The copper kettle, which the underground people left behind them, was preserved as a memorial upon the island, which bears the name of House Island to the present day. End of The Dwarf's Banquet Section 20 of Folklore and Legends, Scandinavian This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Jump Folklore and Legends Scandinavian by Charles John Tibbets The Icelandic Sorceresses Tell me, 
said Katla, a handsome and lively widow, to Gunlaugar, an accomplished and gallant young warrior. Tell me why thou goest so oft to Mafalada. Is it to caress an old woman? Thine own age, Katla, answered the youth inconsiderately, might prevent thy making that of Gerida a subject of reproach. I little deemed, replied the offended matron, that we were on an equality in that particular. But thou, who supposest that Gerida is the sole source of knowledge, mayest find that there are others who equal her in science. It happened in the course of the following winter that Gunlaugar, in company with Otto, the son of Katla, had renewed one of those visits to Gerida with which Katla had upbraided him. "'Thou shalt not depart to-night,' said the sage matron. "'Evil spirits are abroad, and thy bad destiny predominates.' "'We are two in company,' answered Gunlaugar, "'and have therefore nothing to fear.' "'Otto,' replied Gerida, "'will be of no aid to thee. "'But go, since thou wilt go, "'and pay the penalty of thy own rashness.' "'In their way they visited the rival matron, "'and Gunlaugar was invited to remain in her house that night. "'This he declined, and passing forward alone, "'was next morning found lying before the gate of his father, Thorbjorn, "'severely wounded and deprived of his judgment. "'Various causes were assigned for this disaster, "'but Otto, asserting that they had parted in anger that evening from Gerida, "'insisted that his companion must have sustained the injury through her sorcery.' Gerida was accordingly cited to the popular assembly and accused of witchcraft, but twelve witnesses, or compurgators, having asserted upon their oath the innocence of the accused party, Gerida was honorably freed from the accusation brought against her. Her acquittal did not terminate the rivalry between the two sorceresses, for Gerida belonging to the family of Kilia Khan, and Katla to that of the pontiff Snorro, the animosity which still subsisted between these septs became awakened by the quarrel. It chanced that Thorbjorn, called Digri, or the Corpulent, one of the family of Snorro, had some horses which fed in the mountain pastures, near to those of Thorarin, called the Black, the son of the enchantress Gerida. But when autumn arrived, and the horses were to be withdrawn from the mountains and housed for the winter, those of Thorbjorn could nowhere be found, and Otto, the son of Katla, being sent to consult a wizard, brought back a dubious answer which seemed to indicate that they had been stolen by Thorarin. Thorbjorn, with Otto and a party of armed followers, immediately set forth for Mafalada, the dwelling of Gerida and her son Thorarin. Arrived before the gate, they demanded permission to search for the horses which were missing. This Thorarin refused, alleging that neither was the search demanded duly authorized by law, nor were the proper witnesses cited to be present, nor did Thorbjorn offer any sufficient pledge of security when claiming the exercise of so hazardous a privilege. Thorbjorn replied that, as Thorarin declined to permit a search, he must be held as admitting his guilt, and constituting for that purpose a temporary court of justice by choosing out six judges, he formally accused Thorarin of theft before the gate of his own house. At this the patience of Gerida forsook her. Well, said she to her son Thorarin, is it said of thee that thou art more a woman than a man, or thou wouldst not bear these intolerable affronts? Thorarin, fired at the reproach, rushed forth with his servants and guests. A skirmish soon disturbed the legal process which had been instituted, and one or two of both parties were wounded and slain before the wife of Thorarin and the female attendants could separate the fray by flinging their mantles over the weapons of the combatants. Thorbjorn and his party retreating, Thorarin proceeded to examine the field of battle. Alas, among the relics of the fight was a bloody hand too slight and fair to belong to any of the combatants. It was that of his wife Ada, who had met this misfortune in her attempts to separate the foes. Incensed to the uttermost, Thorarin threw aside his constitutional moderation, and mounting on horseback with his allies and followers, pursued the hostile party, and overtook them in a hayfield where they had halted to repose their horses, and to exult over the damage they had done to Thorarin. At this moment he assailed them with such fury that he slew Thorbjorn upon the spot, and killed several of his attendants. Although Otto, the son of Katla, escaped free from wounds, having been dressed by his mother in an invulnerable garment. After this action, more blood being shed than usual in an Icelandic engagement, Thorarin returned to Mafalada, 
and being questioned by his mother concerning the events of the skirmish, he answered in the improvisatory and enigmatical poetry of his age and country. From me the foul reproach be far, with which a female waked the war. From me who shunned not in the fray, through foemen fierce to hew my way, since meat it is, the eagle's brood on the fresh corpse should find their food. Then spared I not in fighting field with stalwart hand my sword to wield, and well may claim at Odin's shrine the praise that waits this deed of mine. To which effusion Gerida answered, Do these verses imply the death of Thorbjorn? And Thorarin, alluding to the legal process which Thorbjorn had instituted against him, resumed his song. Chart bit the sword beneath the hood of him whose zeal the cause pursued, and ruddy flowed the stream of death ere the grim brand resumed the sheath. Now on the buckler of the slain the raven sits, his draught to drain, for gore-drenched is his visage bold that hither came his courts to hold. As the consequence of this slaughter was likely to be a prosecution at the instance of the pontiff Snorro, Thorarin had now recourse to his allies and kindred, of whom the most powerful were Arnkill, his maternal uncle, and Veramond, who readily premised their aid both in the field and in the comitia, or the popular meeting. In spring before which it was to be presumed Snorro would indict Thorin for the slaughter of his kinsmen, Arnkill could not, however, forbear asking his nephew how he had so far lost his usual command of temper. He replied in verse, Till then the master of my mood, men called me gentle, mild, and good, but yon fierce dame's sharp tongue might wake in wintry den the frozen snake. While Thorarin spent the winter with his uncle Arnkill, he received information from his mother Gerida that Otto, son of her old rival Katla, was the person who had cut off the hand of his wife Ada, and that he gloried in the fact. Thorarin and Arnkill determined on instant vengeance, and travelling rapidly surprised the house of Katla. The undismayed sorceress, on hearing them approach, commanded her son to sit close beside her, and when the assailants entered they only beheld Katla, spinning coarse yarn from what seemed a large distaff, with her female domestics seated around her. "'My son,' she said, "'is absent on a journey, and Thorarin and Arnkill, having searched the house in vain, were obliged to depart with this answer. They had not, however, gone far before the well-known skill of Katla in optical delusion occurred to them, and they resolved on a second and stricter search. Upon their return, they found Katla in the outer apartment, who seemed to be shearing the hair of a tame kid, but was in reality cutting the locks of her son Otto. Entering the inner room, they found the large distaff flung carelessly upon a bench, they returned yet a third time, and a third delusion was prepared for them, for Katla had given her son the appearance of a hog, which seemed to grovel upon the heap of ashes. Arnkill now seized and split the distaff which he had at first suspected, upon which Katla tauntingly observed that if their visits had been frequent that evening, they could not be said to be altogether ineffectual, since they had destroyed a distaff. They were accordingly returning completely baffled when Gerida met them and upbraided them with carelessness in searching for their enemy. Return yet again, she said, and I will accompany you. Katla's maidens, still upon the watch, announced to her the return of the hostile party, their number augmented by one who wore a blue mantle. Alas, cried Katla, it is the sorceress Gerida, against whom spells will be of no avail. Immediately rising from the raised bed, and boarded seat which she occupied, she concealed Otto beneath it, and covered it with cushions, as before, on which she stretched herself, complaining of indisposition. Upon the entrance of the hostile party, Gerida, without speaking a word, flung aside her mantle, took out a piece of sealskin in which she wrapped Katla's head, and commanded that she should be held by some of the attendants, while the others broke open the boarded space, beneath which Otto lay concealed, seized upon him, bound him, and led him away captive with his mother. Next morning, Otto was hanged and Katla stoned to death, but not until she had confessed that through her sorcery she had occasioned the disaster of Gunlaugar, which first led the way to these feuds. End of section 20 Section 21 of Folklore in Legends Scandinavian This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Claudia. Folklore and Legends Scandinavian by Charles John Tibbets. The Three Dogs. Once upon a time, there was a king who traveled to a strange country where he married a queen. When they had been married some time, the queen had a daughter, which gave rise to much joy through the whole land, for all people liked the king, he was so kind and just. As the child was born, there came an old woman into the room. She was of a strange appearance, and nobody could guess where she came from or to what place she was going. This old woman declared that the royal child must not be taken out under the sky until it was fifteen years old. If she was, she would be in danger of being carried away by the giants of the mountains. The king, when he was told what the woman had said, heeded her words and set a guard to see that the princess did not come out into the open air. In a short time, the queen bore another daughter, and there was again much joy in the land. The old woman once more made her appearance, and she said that the king must not let the young princess go out under the sky before she was fifteen. The queen had a third daughter, and the third time the old woman came, warning the king respecting this child as she had done regarding the two former. The king was much distressed, for he loved his children more than anything else in the world, so he gave strict orders that the three princesses should be always kept indoors and he commanded that every one should respect his edict a considerable time passed by and the princesses grew up to be the most beautiful girls that could be seen far or near then a war began and the king had to leave his home one day while he was away at the seat of war the three princesses sat at a window looking at how the sun shone on the flowers in the garden they felt that they would like very much to go and play among the flowers and they begged the guards to let them out for a little while to walk in the garden the guards refused for they were afraid of the king but the girls begged of them so prettily and so earnestly that they could not long refuse them so they let them do as they wished the princesses were delighted and ran out into the garden but their pleasure was short-lived scarcely had they got into the open air when a cloud came down and carried them off and no one could find them again though they searched the wide world over the whole of the people mourned and the king as you may imagine was very much grieved when on his return home he learned what had happened however there is an old saying what's done cannot be undone so the king had let matters remain as they were as no one could advise him how to recover his daughters, the king caused proclamation to be made throughout the land that whoever should bring them back to him from the power of the mountain giants should have one of them for his wife and half the kingdom as a wedding present. As soon as this proclamation was made in the neighboring countries, many young warriors went out with servants and horses to look for the three princesses there were at the king's court at the time two foreign princes and they started off too to see how fortunate they might be they put on fine armor and took costly weapons and they boasted of what they would do and how they would never come back until they had accomplished their purpose we will leave these two princes to wander here and there in their search and look at what was passing in another place deep down in the heart of a wild wood there dwelt at the time an old woman who had an only son who used daily to attend to his mother's three hogs as the lad roamed through the forest he one day cut a little pipe to play on he found much pleasure in the music and he played so well that the notes charmed all who heard him the boy was well built of an honest heart and feared nothing one day it chanced that as he was sitting in the wood playing on his pipe while his three hogs grubbed among the roots of the pine trees a very old man came along he had a beard so long that it reached to his waist and a large dog accompanied him when the lad saw the dog he said to himself i wish i had a dog like that as a companion here in the wood then there would be no danger the old man knew what the boy thought and he said i have come to ask you to let me give you my dog for one of your hogs 
the lad was ready to close the bargain and gave a gray hog in exchange for the big dog as he was going the old man said i think you will be satisfied with your bargain the dog is not like other dogs his name is holdfast and if you tell him to hold hold he will whatever it may be were it even the fiercest giant then he departed and the lad thought that for once at all events fortune had been kind to him when evening had come the lad called his dog and drove the hogs to his home in the forest when the old woman learnt how her son had given away the grey hog for a dog she flew into a great rage and gave him a good beating the lad begged her to be quiet but it was of no use for she only seemed to get the more angry when the boy saw that it was no good pleading he called to the dog hold fast the dog at once rushed forward and seized the old woman held her so firmly that she could not move but he did her no harm the old woman now had to promise that she would agree to what her son had done but she could not help thinking that she had suffered a great misfortune in losing her fat gray hog the next day the boy went once more to the forest with his dog and the two hogs when he arrived there he sat down and played upon his pipe as usual and the dog danced to the music in such a wonderful manner that it was quite amazing while he thus sat the old man with the gray beard came up to him out of the forest he was accompanied by a dog as large as the former one when the boy saw the fine animal he said to himself i wish i had that dog as a companion in this wood then there would be no danger the old man knew what he thought and he said i have come to ask you to let me give you my dog for one of your hogs the boy did not hesitate long but agreed to the bargain he got the big dog and the man took the hog in exchange as he went the old man said i think you will be satisfied with your bargain the dog is not like other dogs he is called tear and if you tell him to tear tear he will in pieces whatever it be even the fiercest mountain giant then he departed and the boy was glad at heart thinking he had made a good bargain though he well knew his old mother would not be much pleased at it towards evening he went home and his mother was not a bit less angry than she had been on the previous day she dared not beat her son however for his big dogs made her afraid it usually happens that when women have scolded enough they at last give in so it was now the boy and his mother became friends once more but the old woman thought that she had sustained such a loss as could never again be made good the boy went to the forest again with the hog and the two dogs he was very happy and sitting down on the trunk of a tree he played as usual on his pipe and the dogs danced in such a fine fashion that it was a treat to look at them while the boy thus sat amusing himself the old man with the gray beard again appeared out of the forest he had with him a third dog as large as either of the others when the boy saw it he said to himself i wish i had that dog as a companion in this wood then there would be no danger the old man said i came because i wished you to see my dog for i well know you would like to have him the lad was ready enough and the bargain was made so he got the big dog giving his last hog for it the old man then departed saying i think you will be satisfied with your bargain the dog is not like other dogs he is called quick ear and so quick does he hear that he knows all that takes place be it ever so many miles away why he hears even the trees and the grass growing in the fields then the old man went off and the lad felt very happy for he thought he had nothing now to be afraid of as evening came on the boy went home and his mother was sorely grieved when she found her son had parted with her all but he told her to bid farewell to sorrow saying that he would see she had no loss the lad spoke so well that the old woman was quite pleased at daybreak the lad went out a-hunting with his two dogs and in the evening he came back with as much game as he could carry he hunted till his mother's larder was well stocked 
then he bade her farewell telling her he was going to travel to see what fortune had in store for him and called his dogs to him he travelled on over hills and along gloomy roads till he got deep in a dark forest there the old man with the grey beard met him the lad was very glad to fall in with him again and said to him good day father i thank you for our last meeting good day answered the old man where are you going i am going into the world said the boy to see what fortune i shall have go on said the old man and you will come to a royal palace there you will have a change of fortune with that they parted but the lad paid good heed to the old man's words and he kept on his way when he came to a house he played on his pipe while his dogs danced and so he got food and shelter and whatever he wanted having travelled for some days he at last entered a large city through the streets of which great crowds of people were passing the lad wondered what was the cause of all of this at last he came to where proclamation was being made that whoever should rescue the three princesses from the hands of the mountain giants should have one of them for his wife and half the kingdom with her then the lad remembered what the old man had told him and understood what he meant he called his dogs to him and went on till he came to the palace there from the time that the princesses disappeared the place had been filled with sorrow and mourning and the king and the queen grieved more than all the others the boy entered the palace and begged to be allowed to play to the king and show him his dogs the people of the palace were much pleased at this for they thought it might do something to make the king forget his grief so they let him go in and show what he could do when the king heard how he played and saw how wonderfully his dogs danced he was so merry that no one had seen him so during the seven long years that had passed since he lost his daughters when the dancing was finished the king asked the boy what he should give him as a return for the amusement he had given them my lord king said the boy i am not come here for silver goods or gold i ask one thing of you that you will give me leave to go and seek the three princesses who are now in the hands of the mountain giants when the king heard this he knit his brow so you think said he that you can restore my daughters this task is a dangerous one and men who were better than you have suffered in it if however any one save the princesses i will never break my word the lad thought these words kingly and honest he bade farewell to the king and set out determined that he would not rest till he found what he wanted he travelled through many great countries without any extraordinary adventure and wherever he went his dogs went with him quick ear ran and heard what there was to hear in the place holdfast carried the bag and on tear who was the strongest of the three the lad rode when he was tired one day quick ear came running fast to his master to tell him that he had been near a high mountain and he had heard one of the princesses spinning within it the giant quick ear said was not at home at this the boy felt very glad and he made haste to the mountain with his dogs when they were come to it quick ear said we have no time to lose the giant is only ten miles away and i can hear his horse's golden shoes beating on the stones the lad at once ordered his dogs to break in the door of the mountain which they did he entered and saw a beautiful maiden who sat spinning gold thread on a spindle of gold he stepped forward and spoke to her she was much astonished and said who are you that dare to come into the giant's hall for seven long years have i lived here and never during that time have i looked on a human being run away for heaven's sake before the giant comes or you will lose your life the boy told her his errand and said he would await the troll's coming while they were talking the giant came riding on his gold-shod horse and stopped outside the mountain when he saw that the door was open he was very angry and called out in such a voice that the whole mountain shook to its base who has broken open my door 
the boy boldly answered, I did it, and now I will break you too. Hold fast, hold him fast. Tear and quick ear, tear him into a thousand pieces. Hardly had he spoken the words when the three dogs rushed forward, threw themselves on the giant, and tore him into numberless pieces. The princess was very glad and said, Heaven be thanked, now I am free. She threw herself onto the lad's neck and kissed him. The lad would not stop in the place, so he saddled the giant's horses, put on them all the goods and gold he found, and set off with the beautiful young princess. They traveled together for a long time, the lad waiting on the maiden with that respect and attention that such a noble lady deserved. It chanced one day that Quick Ear, who had gone before to obtain news, came running fast to his master and informed him that he had been to a high mountain and had heard another of the king's daughters sitting within it spinning gold thread. The giant, he said, was not at home. The lad was well pleased to hear this, and he hastened to the mountain with his three dogs. When they arrived there, Quick Ear said, We have no time to waste. The giant is but eight miles off. I can hear the sound of his horse's gold shoes on the stones. The lad ordered the dogs to break in the door, and when they had done so, he entered and found a beautiful maiden sitting in the hall, winding gold thread. The lad stepped forward and spoke to her. She was much surprised and said, Who are you? Who dare to come into the giant's dwelling? Seven long years have I lived here, and never during that time have I looked on a human being. Run away, for heaven's sake, before the giant comes, or you will lose your life. The lad told her why he had come, and said he would wait for the giant's return home. In the midst of their talk, the giant came, riding on his gold-shod horse, and stopped outside the mountain. When he saw the door was open, he was in a great rage, and called out with such a voice that the mountain shook to its base. Who? said he has broken open my door. The lad answered boldly, I did it, and now I will break you. Hold fast, hold him fast. Tear and quick ear, tear him into a thousand pieces. The dogs straightway sprang forward and threw themselves onto the giant and tore him into pieces as numberless as are the leaves which fall in the autumn. Then the princess was very glad and said, Heaven be thanked, now I am free. She threw herself onto the lad's neck and kissed him. He led her to her sister, and one can well imagine how glad they were to meet. The lad took all the treasures that the giant's dwelling contained, put them on the gold-shod horses, and set out with the two princesses. They again traveled a great distance, and the youth waited on the princesses with the respect and care they deserved. It chanced one day that Quick Ear, who went before to get news, came running fast to his master, and told him he had been near a high mountain, and had heard the third princess sitting within, spinning cloth of gold. The giant himself was not in. The youth was well pleased to hear this, and he hurried to the mountain accompanied by his dogs. When they came there, Quick Ear said, "'There's no time to be lost.' The giant is not more than five miles off, I well know it. I hear the sound of his horse's gold shoes on the stones. The lad told his dogs to break in the door, and they did so. When he entered the mountain, he saw there a maiden sitting and weaving cloth of gold. She was so beautiful that the lad thought another such could not be found in the world. He advanced and spoke to her. The young princess was much astonished, and said, who are you, who dare to come into the giant's hall? For seven long years have I lived here, and never during that time have I looked on a human being. For heaven's sake, added she, run away before the giant comes, or he will kill you. The lad, however, was brave, and said that he would lay down his life for the beautiful princess. In the middle of their talk, home came the giant, riding on his horse with the golden shoes, and stopped at the mountain. When he came in and saw what unwelcome visitors were there, he was very much afraid, for he knew what had happened to his brethren. He thought it best to be careful and cunning, for he dared not act openly. 
He began, therefore, with fine words and was very smooth and amiable. He told the princess to dress meat so that he might entertain the guests and behaved in such a friendly manner that the lad was perfectly deceived and forgot to be on his guard. He sat down at the table with the giant. The princess wept in secret, and the dogs were very uneasy, but no one noticed it. When the giant and his guest had finished the meal, the youth said, I am no longer hungry. Give me something to drink. There is, said the giant, a spring up in the mountain, which runs with sparkling wine, but I have no one to fetch of it. If that is all, said the lad, one of my dogs can go up there. The giant laughed in his false heart when he heard that, for what he wanted was that the lad should send away his dogs. The lad told Holdfast to go for the wine, and the giant gave him a large jug. The dog went, but one might see that he did so very unwillingly. Time went on and on, but the dog did not come back. After some time, the giant said, I wonder why the dog is so long away. It might, perhaps, be as well to let another dog go to help him. He has to go a long distance, and the jug is a heavy one to carry. The lad, suspecting no trickery, fell in with the giant's suggestion, and told Tare to go and see why Holdfast did not come. The dog wagged his tail and did not want to leave his master, but he noticed it and drove him off to the spring. The giant laughed to himself, and the princess wept, but the lad did not mark it, being very merry, jested with his entertainer, and did not dream of any danger. A long time passed, but neither the wine nor the dogs appeared. "'I can well see,' said the giant, "'that your dogs do not do what you tell them, or we would not sit here thirsty.' It seems to me it would be best to send Quickier to ascertain why they don't come back. The lad was nettled at that and ordered his third dog to go in haste to the spring. Quickier did not want to go, but whined and crept to his master's feet. Then the lad became angry and drove him away. The dog had to obey, so away he set in great haste to the top of the mountain. When he reached it, it happened to him as it had to the others. There arose a high wall around him, and he was made a prisoner by the giant's sorcery. When all the three dogs were gone, the giant stood up, put on a different look, and gripped his bright sword which hung upon the wall. "'Now will I avenge my brethren,' said he, "'and you shall die this instant, for you are in my hands.' The lad was frightened and repented that he had parted with his dogs. "'I will not ask for my life,' said he, "'for I must die some day. I only ask one thing, that I may say my paternoster and play a psalm on my pipe. That is the custom in my country.' The giant granted him his wish, but said he would not wait long. The lad knelt down and devoutly said his paternoster, and began to play upon his pipe so that it was heard over the hill and dale. That instant the magic lost its power and the dogs were once more set free. They came down like a blast of wind and rushed into the mountain. Then the lad sprang up and cried, Hold fast! Hold him! Tear and quick ear! Tear him into a thousand pieces! The dogs flew on the giant and tore him into countless shreds. Then the lad took all the treasures in the mountain, harnessed the giant's horses to a golden chariot, and made haste to be gone. As may well be imagined, the young princesses were very glad at being thus saved, and they thanked the lad for having delivered them from the power of the mountain giants. He himself fell deep in love with the youngest princess, and they vowed to be true and faithful. So they traveled with mirth and jest and great gladness, and the lad waited on the princesses with the respect and care they deserved. As they went on, the princesses played with the lad's hair, and each one hung her finger ring in his long locks as a keepsake. One day, as they were journeying, they came up with two wanderers who were going the same way. They had on tattered clothes, their feet were sore, and altogether one would have thought they had come a long distance. 
the lad stopped his chariot and asked them who they were and where they came from the strangers said they were two princes who had gone out to look for the three maidens who had been carried off to the mountains they had however searched in vain so they had now to go home more like beggars than princes when the lad heard that he had pity on the two wanderers and he asked them to go with him in the beautiful chariot the princes gave him many thanks for the favor so they travelled on together till they came to the land over which the father of the princesses ruled now when the princes heard how the poor lad had rescued the princesses they were filled with envy thinking how they themselves had wandered to no purpose they considered how they could get rid of him and obtain the honour and rewards for themselves so one day they suddenly set on him seized him by the throat and nearly strangled him then they threatened to kill the princesses until they took an oath not to reveal what they had done and they being in the prince's power did not dare to refuse however they were very sorry for the youth who had risked his life for them and the youngest princess mourned him with all her heart and would not be comforted after having done this the princes went on to the king's domains and one can well imagine how glad the king was to once more see his three daughters meanwhile the poor lad lay in the forest as if he were dead he was not however forsaken for the three dogs lay down by him kept him warm and licked his wounds they attended to him till he got his breath again and came once more to life when he had regained life and strength he began his journey and came after having endured many hardships to the king's domains where the princesses lived when he went into the palace he marked that the whole place was filled with mirth and joy and in the royal hall he heard dancing and the sound of harps the lad was much astonished and asked what it all meant you have surely come from a distance said the servant not to know that the king has got back his daughters from the mountain giants two elder princesses are married to-day the lad asked about the youngest princess whether she was to be married the servant said she would have no one but wept continually and no one could find out the reason for her sorrow then the lad was glad for he well knew that his love was faithful and true to him he went up into the guard-room and sent a message to the king that a guest had come who prayed that he might add to the wedding mirth by exhibiting his dogs the king was pleased and ordered that the stranger should be well received when the lad came into the hall the wedding guests much admired his smartness and his manly form and they all thought they had never before seen so brave a young man when the three princesses saw him they knew him at once rose from the table and ran into his arms then the princes thought they had better not stay there for the princesses told how the lad had saved them and how all had befallen as a proof of the truth of what they said they showed their rings in the lad's hair when the king knew how the two foreign princes had acted so treacherously and basely he was much enraged and ordered that they should be driven off his domains with disgrace the brave youth was welcomed with great honor as indeed he deserved and he was the same day married to the youngest princess when the king died the youth was chosen ruler over the land and made a brave king there he yet lives with his beautiful queen and there he governs prosperously to this day i know no more about him end of section twenty one recording by claudia section twenty two of folklore and legend scandinavian this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kurt Troutwine. Folklore and Legends Scandinavian by Charles John Tibbets. The Legend of Thorgunna. A ship from Iceland chanced to winter in a haven near Hogafels. Among the passengers was a woman named Thorgunna, a native of the Hebrides who was reported by the sailors to possess garments and household furniture of a fashion far surpassing those used in Iceland. Therida, sister of Pontus Snaro and wife of Thorod, a woman of a vain and covetous disposition, attracted by these reports, 
made a visit to the stranger, but could not prevail upon her to display her treasures. Persisting, however, in her inquiries, she pressed Thorgana to take up her abode at the house of Thorod. The Hebridean reluctantly assented, but added that as she could labor at every usual kind of domestic industry, she trusted in that manner to discharge the obligation she might lie under to the family without giving any part of her property in recompense of her lodging. As Thorida continued to urge her request, Thorgana accompanied her to Froda, the house of Thorod where the seaman deposited a huge chest and cabinet containing the property of her new guest, which the writer viewed with curious and covetous eyes. So soon as they had pointed out to Thurgunna the place assigned for her bed, she opened the chest and took forth such an embroidered bed coverlid and such a splendid and complete set of tapestry hangings and bed furniture of English linen interwoven with silk as had never been seen in Iceland. Sell to me said the covetous matron, this fair bed furniture. Believe me, answered Thurgunna, I will not lie upon straw in order to feed my pomp and vanity. An answer which so greatly displeased the reader that she never again repeated her request. Thurgunna, to whose character subsequent events added something of a mystical solemnity, is described as being a woman of a tall and stately appearance, of a dark complexion, and having a profusion of black hair. She was advanced in age, assiduous in the labors of the field and of the loom, faithful attendant upon divine worship, grave, silent, and solemn in domestic society. She had little intercourse with the household of Thorod, and showed particular dislike to two of its inmates. These were Thoror, having lost a leg in the skirmish between Thorbjorn and Thorian the Black, was called Thor Widlegger, wooden leg from the substitute he had adopted, and his wife Thorgrima, called Galdrakina, wicked sorceress, from her supposed skill in enhancements. Kierton, the son of Thurida, a boy of excellent promise, was the only person of the household to whom Thurgana showed much affection, and she was much vexed at times when the childish petulance of the boy made an indifferent return to her kindness. After the mysterious stranger had dwelt at Froda for some time, and while she was laboring in the hayfield with the other members of the family, a sudden cloud from the northern mountain led Thorod to anticipate a heavy shower. He instantly commanded the hay-workers to pile up in ricks the quantity which each had been engaged in turning to the wind. It was afterwards remembered that Thurgunna did not pile up her portion, but left it spread on the field. The clouds approached with great celerity and sank so heavily around the farm that it was scarce possible to see beyond the limits of the field. A heavy shower next ascended, and so soon as the clouds broke away and the sun shone forth, it was observed that it had rained blood. That which fell upon the ricks of the other laborers soon dried up, but what Thorgana had wrought upon remained wet with gore. The unfortunate Herbridean, appalled at the omen, betook herself to her bed and was seized with mortal illness. On the approach of death, she summoned Thorod, her landlord, and entrusted to him the disposition of her property and effects. Let my body, said she, be transported to Skullholt, for my mind presages that in that place shall be founded the most distinguished church in this island. Let my golden ring be given to the priest who shall celebrate my obsequies, and do thou indemnify thyself for the funeral charges out of my remaining effects. To thy wife I bequeath my purple mantle, in order that, by the sacrifice to her avarice, I may secure the right of disposing of the rest of my effects at my own pleasure. But for my bed, with its coverings, hangings, and furniture, I entreat that they all be consigned to the flames. I do not desire this because I envy any one the possession of these things after my death, but because I wish those evils to be avoided which I plainly foresee will happen if my will be altered in the slightest particular. Thorod promised faithfully to execute this extraordinary testament in the most exact manner. Accordingly, so soon as Thorgana was dead, her faithful executor prepared a pile for burning her splendid bed. Thurida entered and learned with anger and astonishment the purpose of these preparations, 
to the remonstrances of her husband she answered that the menaces of future danger were only caused by thorgunna's selfish envy who did not wish any one should enjoy her treasures after her decease then finding thorod inaccessible to argument she had recourse to caresses and blandishments and at length extorted permission to separate from the rest of the bed furniture the tapestried curtains and coverlid the rest was consigned to the flames in obedience with the will of the testator the body of thurgana being wrapped in new linen and placed in a coffin was next to be transported through the precipices and morasses of iceland to the distant district she had assigned for her place of sepulture a remarkable incident occurred on the way the transporters of the body arrived at evening late weary and drenched with rain in a house called nether ness where the niggard hospitality of the proprietor only afforded them house room without any supply of food or fuel but soon as they entered an unwanted noise heard in the kitchen of the mansion and the figure of a woman soon recognized to be the deceased thorgana was seen busily employed in preparing victuals. their inhospitable landlord being made acquainted with this frightful circumstance readily agreed to supply every refreshment which was necessary on which the vision instantly disappeared the apparition having become public they had no reason to ask twice for hospitality as they proceeded on their journey and they came to skalholt where thagana with all due ceremonies of religion was deposited quietly in the grave but the consequences of the breach of her testament were felt severely at froda the dwelling at froda was a simple and patriarchal structure built according to the fashion used by the wealthy among the icelanders the apartments were very large and a part boarded off contained the beds of the family on either side was a sort of storeroom one of which contained meal the other dried fish every evening large fires were lighted in this apartment for dressing the victuals and the domestics of the family usually sat around them for a considerable time until supper was prepared on the night when the conductors of thorgana's funeral returned to froda there appeared visible to all who were present a meteor or spectral appearance resembling a half moon which glided around the boarded walls of the mansion in an opposite direction of the course of the sun and continued to perform its revolutions until the domestics retired to rest this apparition was renewed every night during a whole week and was pronounced by thor with a wooden leg to presage pestilence or mortality shortly after a herdsman showed signs of mental alienation and gave various indications of having sustained the persecution of evil demons this man was found dead in his bed one morning and then commenced a scene of ghost seeing unheard of in the annals of superstition first victim was thoror who had presaged the calamity going out of doors one evening he was grappled by the spectre of the deceased shepherd as he attempted to re-enter the house his wooden leg stood him in poor steed in such an encounter he was hurled to the earth and so fearfully beaten that he died in consequence of the bruises thor was no sooner dead than his ghost associated itself with that of the herdsman and joined him in pursuing and assaulting the inhabitants of froda meantime an infectious disorder spread fast among them and several of the bondsmen died one after the other strange portents were seen within doors the meal was displaced and mingled and the dried fish flung about in the most alarming manner without any visible agent at length while the servants were forming their evening circle round the fire a spectre resembling the head of a seagullfish was seen to emerge out of the pavement of the room bending its round black eyes full on the tapestried bed curtains of thurgunna some of the domestics ventured to strike at this figure but far from giving way it rather erected itself further from the floor until kiertan who seemed to have natural predominance over these supernatural prodigies seizing a huge forge hammer struck the seal repeatedly on the head and compelled it to disappear forcing it down into the floor as if it had driven a stake into the earth the prodigy was found to intimate a new calamity thorod the master of the family 
had some time before set forth on a voyage to bring home a cargo of dried fish. But in crossing the river Inna, the skiff was lost, and he perished with the servants who attended him. A solemn funeral feast was held at Froda, in memory of the deceased, when, to the astonishment of the guests, the apparition of Thorod and his followers seemed to enter the apartment dripping with water. Yet this vision excited less horror than might have been expected, for the Icelanders, though nominally Christians, retained, among other pagan superstitions, a belief that the specters of such drowned persons as had been favorably received by the goddess Rana were wont to show themselves at their funeral feast. They saw, therefore, with some composure, Thorod and his dripping attendants plant themselves by the fire, from which all mortal guests retreated to make room for them. It was supposed this apparition would not be renewed after the conclusion of the festival, but so far were their hopes disappointed that, so soon as the morning guests had departed, the fires being lighted, Thorod and his comrades marched in on one side, drenched as before with water, on the other entered Thor, heading all of those who had died in pestilence, and who appeared covered with dust. Both parties seized the seats by the fire, while the half-frozen and terrified domestics spent the night without either light or warmth. The same phenomenon took place the next night, though the fires had been lighted in a separate house, and at length Kierton was obligated to compound matters with the spectres by kindling a large fire for them in the principal apartment and one for the family and domestics in a separate hut. This prodigy continued during the whole feast of Joel. Other portents also happened to appall this devoted family. The contagious disease again broke forth, and when any one fell a sacrifice to its spectre, was sure to join the troop of persecutors, who had now almost full possession of the mansion of Froda. Thorgrima Galdrakina, wife of Thor, was one of these victims, and in short, of thirty servants belonging to the household, eighteen died, five fled for fear of the apparitions, so that only seven remained in the service of Kierton. Kierton had now recourse to the advice of his maternal uncle Snorro, in consequence of whose counsel, which will perhaps appear surprising to the reader, judicial measures were instituted against the spectres. A Christian priest was, however, associated with Thordokasa, son of Snorro, and with Kierton to superintend and sanctify the proceedings. The inhabitants were regularly summoned to attend upon the inquest, as in a cause between man and man, and the assembly was constituted before the gate of the mansion, just as the spectres had assumed their wonted position by the fire. Kierton boldly ventured to approach them, and snatching a brand from the fire, he commanded the tapestry belonging to Thorgana to be carried out of doors set fire to it and reduced it to ashes with all other ornaments of her bed which had been so inconsiderately preserved at the request of therida a tribunal then being constituted with usual legal solemnities a charge was preferred by kierton against thor with the wooden leg by thordokasa against thorod and by others chosen as accusers against the individual spectres present accusing them of molesting the mansion and introducing death and disease among its inhabitants. All the solemn rites of the judicial procedure were observed on this singular occasion. Evidence was adduced, charges given, and the cause formally decided. It does not appear that the ghosts put themselves on their defense, so that sentence of ejectment was pronounced against them individually in due and legal form. When Thor heard the judgment, he arose and saying, I have set while it was lawful for me to do so left the apartment by the door opposite to that at which the judicial assembly was constituted. Each of the spectres, as it heard its individual sentence, left the place, saying something which indicated its unwillingness to depart, until Thorod himself was solemnly called on to leave. We have here no longer, said he, a peaceful dwelling, therefore will we remove. Kierton then entered the hall with his followers, and the priest, with holy water, in celebration of a solemn mass, completed the conquest over the goblins, which had been commenced by the power and authority of the Icelandic law. End of The Legend of Thorgana Recording by Kurt Troutwine